blame is the nothing personal word of the day. It's Wednesday, August 17th, 2022. Blame. That's when you do something wrong and you have to explain it. And you say, well, I only did that because someone else made me do it. Someone else said something to me that caused me to do it. Explaining what something happened, why someone did what they did because they experienced something. Blame is something that is supposed to hide all ills. Last night, I watched a seven minute segment on a network partner of Major League Baseball, TBS, during the pregame show of the their game of the day, which was the Yankees Rays, which we'll get to later in the show, I hope. And of course, when a pregame show is put together on one of the networks, whether it's MLB Network, ESPN, or TBS, that run of show, right, the segments, the rundown, that is discussed internally. It is put together by producers. You then go to the on-air talent and say, this is what we're going to talk about. On MLB Network, there is an approval process. There is nothing that gets talked about that is not approved by the commissioner's office and the owner's. No one's turning on MLB Network and saying, oh my God, you're talking about blank. We said no. When they say no, it's no. Government-owned station. On TBS, they're able, because they need credibility, they have to talk about the biggest stories of the day. And there was no bigger story than the suspension of Fernando Tatis. The three players, along with Ernie Johnson, yes, the same Ernie Johnson who does the NBA on TNT, are Curtis Granderson, who, is, who runs the Players Alliance, who is very involved in union activities. Jimmy Rollins, an incredibly great player on and off the field, MVP. And Pedro Martinez, who is one of the top five pitchers of all time. I'd have to do a top five list to confirm that, but, I, but having watched him pitch, having seen what he can do, having met him and looked at his fingers and watched what the ball does, just phenomenal. And Pedro Martinez has stayed involved in the game just last week, he was seen speaking to the chief baseball officer of the Boston Red Sox, trying to see if there's any way that Pedro can be helpful with the insanity that is going on in Boston right now. Major League Baseball and the commissioner is in touch with Pedro Martinez. He is an icon. He is a Hall of Famer. He is someone who has a good head on his shoulders, who understands the game. He was asked about the suspension of Fernando Tatis, and the next seven minutes blew my socks off. Pedro Martinez started by saying, go watch the entire video, but not now. Wait for 44 more minutes. But I'll sum it up for you to make, I'll save you the seven minutes. He started off, he was asked about Fernando Tatis, and he went through an entire monologue, almost uninterrupted until Jimmy Rollins couldn't take it any longer. And Curtis Granderson said, wait a minute, Pedro, I must interject. But for the first six minutes, it was very clear that Pedro was saying that Fernando Tatis should have known better. He grew up around a big league family, his father, Fernando Tatis Sr. There is no way, because he knows how to read English and Spanish, that he should have put any medicine on or in his body where he didn't know what the ingredient was. But then he blamed the San Diego Padres and Major League Baseball for Tatis testing positive for steroids. Ernie Johnson looks at him, and I'm looking at him, saying, what exactly could you say next? How are you going to blame the team? And believe me, if I could blame the San Diego Padres for anything, I'd be first in line. But the credibility of nothing personal is, I'm telling you exactly what happens. Pedro Martinez said that the San Diego Padres should have been on top of Tatis, knowing he's their best young player, knowing he's Dominican. They need to know everything that's going in or on his body. Major League Baseball needs to educate its players, needs to make sure that they are doing things for Dominican players who may not be able to read and write, who don't have computers to Google whether or not certain substances are illegal or legal. And that is on baseball. Let's go one at a time. Let me be very clear, like Crystal Jack Nicholson clear. We, as a front office, do not know what our players are doing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do not assign a trainer or a coach to babysit a player 
The only one I can remember is Josh Hamilton, who had a 24-hour babysitter. Look how that went. If I could have had a 24-hour babysitter for anyone, there are plenty of players I would have done it. But that's not exactly how it works in big league baseball. The players come to the ballpark. You count on them to go to the trainers when they're sick, when they don't feel well, when they're injured for rehab. You are on top of their rehab because they come into the ballpark or they go to your spring training site and they have supervised rehab. Whether it's their arm, their shoulder, their knee, their toes, their head, whatever it is, we are supervising their rehab. We are diagnosing what they have. We are letting them get a second opinion from a neutral doctor. Then we come up with a treatment plan that includes the player, the agent, the union. Everybody knows what we're doing. But then they go home. When we tell players to lose weight and they go home and order McDonald's, we don't know until they weigh themselves again and say, wait a minute, you're not losing weight. Are you eating McDonald's? No. Okay. We have no way of knowing. Now, of course, some players order McDonald's in the clubhouse, and then we have a way of knowing. But when they're at home, how do we know? When players are supposed to take medicine, we tell them when to take it, how often to take it. We, we, what's the word? We, we siphon out the number of pills that are required, when shots are supposed to be given. We administer it in the training room or at the spring training facility. There is nothing for the player to do related to needles or sprays or shots or creams or clears, nothing that they do at home. Do we ask them to sleep with a wrap on their knee and sleep on their side and sleep on their back, try to go to bed early, keep your arm in the sling when you shower, put a plastic bag over it when you're recovering from Tommy John. We'll talk about things that you should be doing at home, but we're not wiping your back. Pedro Martinez claiming that the Padres somehow needed to know that Fernando Tatis was going to treat his ringworm with clobistol, close to ball. I'm probably saying it like cavalry and calvary. Whatever the word is, is the single most unreasonable thing I've ever heard a player say. And for me to say that is saying something. And then on top of that, Ernie Johnson didn't let him get away with it and said, excuse me, what do you mean? And Pedro then said, Dominican players do not have the advantages that American players have. They don't have a player's alliance, which made Curtis Granderson say, well, Pedro, maybe you could start the Dominican players alliance. Players alliance as a way to protect players. Dominican players are doing anything they can. They don't speak English. They don't know how to read. They don't know what's in ingredients. We tell our Dominican players, we've got a training staff in the Dominican, and we tell them, don't put anything in your body without bringing it to the field first. And we say it in Spanish. They don't have to read. They don't have to write. They don't have to think. It is clear as day. But why do more young Dominican players test positive anecdotally than any other type of player? Because what do they have to lose? And there's nothing we can do about that. Yes, we take young Dominican players. Yes, we secrete them away and hide them until they're old enough to sign. Yes, we put them into academy and pretend to teach them English and other skills, but we're just trying to get them good enough to bring them over to the U.S. on a visa, on an H-1NB, I think it was called that, an H-1B visa, to get them over to the U.S. into our facilities so we can really watch them and develop them and see if they can be major league players. The percentage of Dominican players who are in the academies in the Dominican who make it to a major league roster is de minimis. The percentage of Dominican baseball players who even get drafted in the international in the uh, and signed uh, internationally and make it into academy is also de, min- de minimis. So these young Dominican players say to themselves, listen, I have nothing. I have a chance for the riches, the American dream of Major League Baseball. I'm going to do performance enhancing drugs. If I get caught, I get caught, but the majority don't get caught. And that is their best chance to show the US baseball side, hey, I'm good, I can throw 97, bring me over to the States, allocate a visa for me, let me into spring training, bring me up to the Florida State League, give me a chance at a career, get me to America. We've told you from the beginning that all of the nonsense that is spewed by Major League Baseball about how they take care of the Dominican players, the Marlins who stood up and said, we've got the greatest program in the world, not under me, where we are teaching them all these great skills that they can have if they don't make it. We're making them learn English and all the other teams who say they're doing it. 
It is eyewash. It is eyewash to protect the fact that we are doing nothing other than exploiting these kids because the cheapest way to get talent is through the Dominican. That is the biggest payoff you can have. You spend a very little and you get a big return. It's the same thing you do in your business. The more money you can make means that you're spending less and have a higher profit. That's what Dominican players are. So Pedro Martinez says these, these players, of course they're gonna test positive because they can't read. No, they're testing positive because they know exactly what they're doing and they're trying to make it. But that's not the story of Fernando Tatis. Fernando Tatis grew up in a big league family, one. So what that his big league father did steroids? Doesn't matter, two. Fernando Tatis signed a multi hundred million dollar deal. This is not a normal young Dominican player, a teenager. This is an established major leaguer who knows the exact protocols. Pedro Martinez acknowledged that Fernando Tatis would know the protocols, that he should have known to go to the training staff. Any one of the 17 training staffs, all of the secret training staffs that the Padres have, he could have gone to any of them. And they all would have said the same thing. No, do not take that. You will test positive. He didn't go to the training staff. Fernando Tatis is a liar. He lied about his motorcycle injury. He lied about what steroids he took and why he took it. His teammates called him out. Pedro Martinez was very clear saying he made a mistake. I don't want to give him an excuse. However, the Padres still should have known. Explain to me how me as a front office, as a team president, what do you want me to do? I understand. Should I hire 26 people whose sole job is to be the chauffeur and then roommate of all the players? There is not one thing you can do to stop someone from doing something they want to do to hurt themselves, even when you are watching them 24 hours a day. Where there is a will, there is a way. You can sneak out of a room. You can get your babysitter drunk, have them pass out, and then you can start shooting up. When you want to be bad, when you want to violate laws, when you want to cut corners, you can do it. To put the responsibility on the front office is irresponsible and wrong, and he didn't stop there. He then went on to MLB to say that MLB is also responsible. When you've got the face of baseball testing positive, you've got to find a way to make sure that that doesn't happen. I grant you Tatis was the face of baseball. But Tatis knew that. I grant you that MLB wanted Tatis to be the face of baseball, diversity, charm, market out in San Diego, try to get competition with the Dodgers, all sorts of positives. What exactly was MLB going to do if Fernando Tatis had it in his mind that he wanted to take steroids to try to heal faster? Forget Tatis Sr. saying that those don't make you heal faster. Those don't promote muscle growth. Those aren't testosterone. Horse hockey. When you take glass ball, you're doing it for one reason, one reason only. You are doing it to heal faster, you are doing it to get stronger, and you are doing it to violate the joint drug program, period. You know exactly what you are doing. Tatis knew exactly what he was doing. He doesn't get a pass. The Padres don't get blame. MLB doesn't get blame. At what point do you stop blaming parents for the actions of their kids? I guess when they're four, you can still blame the parents. Maybe when they're 14, you can say, man, those are some crappy parents. But I guess when the player attains majority age, when you're over 18, when you can be tried in as adult, when you're treated as an adult in our criminal justice system, when you understand actions have consequences, I don't know how you keep blaming parents or GMs or presidents or commissioners. Curtis Granderson and Jimmy Rollins did not let Pedro get away with it. Pedro stood down as it related to excusing Fernando Tatis, but stood up as he agreed and doubled down on the responsibility of the team in the league. The league's going to have to give Pedro a call, by the way. The league uses Pedro as an ambassador. They cannot have Pedro saying that. It cannot be out there. The next time Pedro is on the air, you want to hear a wait to see? I'll give you a wait to see right now, Coca. An unscheduled wait to see. 
This will be addressed again by Pedro the next time he is behind the microphone in a pregame show. I don't know when that is. I don't know when the next TBS game is. Coca will be able to figure it out. But Pedro will have to say something because he's going to get a call from not the deputy commissioner. He's going to get a call from the commissioner. He's going to get a call from other players in the league. And he's going to have to further clarify his point and absolve anybody on the team, anybody in the front office, anybody in the league from any sort of blame. And Fernando, by the way, if you've got your cell phone still working, you should call Pedro and suggest that he not take heat for you. You should own and take responsibility for what you did instead of having all players, former and current, talk for you where you've disappeared after your one statement saying that you're completely devastated that you can't be with your team. Well, if you're completely devastated, then maybe you would not have used steroids. So now the front office has to deal with all sorts of collateral damage for what Tatis did, forgetting the fact that the Padres have lost two in a row to the Marlins now. The Padres are clinging to a playoff spot. I think they're one game up on the Brewers who beat the Dodgers last night. God, the ultimate irony of the Padres missing the playoffs. It's so good. It's so good. It's like a dream come true. But when something happens to a player like Tatis, it also leaks to the business side. And one of you had a question about it. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson? Get into my Twitter at David P. Samson. David, did you see that the Padres canceled the Tatis bobblehead and they now have a Soto giveaway? Can you explain the decision-making process and how this works? Yes, I can. Let's go back to the off-season because that's when the giveaway calendar is done. The marketing people get together. They come up with a plan with the sales department. They look at the schedule, which comes out internally. You get your first draft in July. So the marketing and sales department starts looking at different game times with the baseball department. When is there a getaway day? When's there an afternoon game that has to happen? When is there a night game? When are our best opponents? And then you figure out with the finance department how many people you're going to project at each game. Where can we have the biggest impact with certain giveaways? Then the marketing department comes up with the hip giveaways, and then the sales department sells those giveaways as part of corporate sponsor packages. And everybody gets together, and they come up with the giveaway calendar. It becomes a big deal when you announce it, but it's all done. Before the previous season even ends, the giveaway calendars are done for the next year. We always used to have to tell our baseball department, uh, we would always tell our marketing department and sales department, hey, you're doing a calendar. All right, put these three players in the first few months because they're likely to be traded at the deadline. They may not even make it through the offseason. This guy put in August because we're not getting rid of him no matter how crappy we are. So the baseball department would actually choose the order of the baseball calendar. We would look at the giveaways. If we have a bobblehead of a player who we know there's a chance won't be here, we're going to have the bobblehead done early. So we're doing all sorts of things. We're working together because we're a collaborative team. Fine. They get together off season. They're in the Padres. They're doing a Tatis bobblehead sometime in August. And it's brilliant. The baseball department says, great, no worries. When is it? September 7th? All right, whatever. Is that really critical to the story that you just had a yell in my ear, September 7th, not August 22nd? Does it really matter for crying out loud? I don't even know what I was saying. All right, I guess we're going to break. Wait, did we finish the Tatis thing? Did we even talk about? No, okay. So it's September 7th, and that's planned exactly how it should have been in the off season because you honor Tatis with the bobblehead in September because obviously he's on a 13, 14 year deal. Tatis isn't going anywhere. Makes perfect sense. You're sure as hell not putting Eric Hosmer in a September bobblehead or Will Myers in a September bobblehead because the Padres have been trying to trade them for about four to six years. So Tatis tests positive for steroids, gets suspended. Here's a little nugget. The September 7th bobbleheads are already in the ballpark in San Diego. The bobbleheads come from China and they come early. They come in huge boxes 
And there are places when you build a stadium where you store your giveaways for the year. There are trucks that come in, there are forklifts, they put the bobbleheads in, whether it's 20,000, 25,000, 15,000, doesn't matter. You put them in the storage room, sort of last in, last out, first in, last out, Philo. So the first giveaways put into the storage room are the last ones out because those are the ones in September. And then the last bobble, the last bobblehead or the last giveaway put into the huge storage room is the first giveaway of the year. Because of course that makes sense from an inventory standpoint. So then the Padres get together right after there's a suspension and they go to the team president and say, what do you want to do about the September 7th bobblehead? Guess who the first call goes to? It goes to the sponsor of the bobblehead. Every single bobblehead has a sponsor and often you've got an outfield wall sign, you've got two commercial spots during radio, two commercial spots during the TV broadcast. You've got one page in the yearbook. You've got one community appearance that you sponsor and you've got one giveaway. Put that all together, add four season tickets and you've got yourself a $250,000 sponsorship. You go to that sponsor and say, hey, we've got a Tatis bobblehead, it's all done, here's your name. What is your view? Before we tell you what our view is, are you okay being associated with Tatis and doing this bobblehead on September 7th? The answer will be every time, no. Replace it. We're not gonna pay for it to be replaced, but under our contract, we have the right, if there is a suspended player, or if there is a traded player, or if there is something where a player acts in a certain way against a morals clause, that a sponsor can say, we don't want to be associated with that player anymore. The bobblehead sponsor, whoever it is, tells the Padres, eh, we're good, don't want it. The Padres cannot get their money back on the bobbleheads, they've already paid for them, you can't return the bobbleheads. The Padres got together and said, we cannot honor Tatis, our sponsor doesn't want it, and we want our fans to know that we take steroids seriously and we are pissed as hell at Tatis. We don't have any Soto giveaways, we just got Soto, our giveaway calendar's done before the season starts. He's a trade deadline acquisition, boom, this is easy. We'll do a bunch of shirts, you don't do bobbleheads of Soto, you can't get them done in time, but it's very simple that you just do shirts. Petco is the sponsor of the bobblehead. That's part of their naming rights deal. That's perfect. You get certain signs, you get certain mentions, you get certain giveaways, you get a suite, you get tickets. That's why when a naming rights deal comes out, you never really know how much is for the naming rights. Total side note story here. When you've got a deal, let's say the Mets deal with Citibank is $20 million a year. And when that game, when that deal came out, everyone said, oh my God, the Mets got 20 million for their naming rights. But that's not accurate. You have to go into way more detail. What product is given to City Bank? And then you realize that they've got two suites. Well, those suites go for a million dollars each per year. So that gets allocated to the deal. So now the naming rights part is down to 18 million. They get three giveaways. Giveaways cost 100 grand each. They're down to 17 million 700,000. They get eight season tickets in four different locations. That's a cost of 300 grand a year. You're down to 17 million on and on and on. And then you realize you get to a point, wow, the naming rights part of it, they get an outfield wall sign, they get a behind the plate sign. The going rate for behind the plate is 2 million a year. The going rate for an outfield wall sign is a million and a half a year. Before you know it, the naming rights of the stadium, right, is 12 million. So I'm here going after 20 when in fact I should have been going after 12. But suffice to say that we can be very secretive about how we explain to you what our deals are to make us look even better. Every team does that. They want to announce the biggest possible number so that they believe and you believe that these companies are really investing in this team. They're really behind this team. They really want to name that ballpark. So the next time you see a naming rights deal, make sure you ask for the details because what you have left, that's actually for the naming rights deal. So you can't do a bobblehead for Soto. No chance. You can't do any sort of knickknack. They're all made in China. They will not get here by boat fast enough. So you got to go local. Local, you have a chance to get shirts made. So all of a sudden, the Padres announced that there will be a Juan Soto City Connect jersey giveaway on September 7th. Made me smile. Going from Tatis to Soto was a no-brainer. Going from bobblehead to shirt had to happen. Logistically speaking, that's a no-brainer as well. 
the front office of the Padres is despondent beyond repair that they've got to sit on these bobbleheads. They've got to hope that they can give them away once the suspension is done. They're going to put bobbleheads back on the calendar. It may not even be next year. It could be two years from now when people have forgotten about this and he's totally rehabilitated himself. He's back on the field, back performing, but they've got the inventory. The only time you get rid of your bobblehead inventory is when you trade a player and you have made a decision as a front office that you are not going to do a bobblehead of a player you have traded. Now, if you trade a player who you didn't trade for money, I would be okay giving away that bobblehead, but every player we traded was always to save money. And it happened to us twice, I think with Ryan Dempster and with Julian Tavares, where we traded the player before the bobblehead day. And what we do in that case is we cancel the giveaway, we write it off, we have to do a make good to the sponsor, so it costs us an extra 50, 100, or 150 grand, and then we beg and plead the player to take his bobbleheads. And the only one who would do it was Julian Tavares. The guy took thousands of his own bobbleheads. God bless you, Julian. Thank you for that. I've never got a chance to thank you an extra time, but you really saved us that day. I think that year was 2002, but I'm not sure. So the decision-making process is an easy one. I appreciate the question. You can't do a bobblehead of a suspended player. You can't do a giveaway, and you start mitigating the damage, and you start immediately. All right, we come back. We're going to talk about Zoe Deutsch again and talk about her career, and then we're going to get to uh, a suspension that happened in Major League Baseball, and we're going to have to talk about the Yankees. We're just going to have to talk about the Yankees. Come on back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. How are you? Thank you. So your only job today is to listen for 45 minutes. We need that full retention. Please tell your friends about Nothing Personal. Keep this train rolling. We just put more gas in it. It is rolling. We appreciate you. Rate, review, follow, do what you do. I watch a movie every day. And uh, I'm going to be watching today the new documentary that came out about the girlfriend that didn't exist, that Notre Dame football player. Coca told me I have to watch it, so I'm going to watch it. It's two hours. I'll get to it today. But I watched yesterday a movie called Not Okay. You know how there's some actors and actresses that no matter what, you're going to watch what they do? It's very hard to get into that category. So I've got Tom Cruise in that category. I've got many, many people in that category, actually. I just want to know their work. Uh, Zoe Deutsch is now in that category for me. When she does a movie, I'm watching it. I don't care what it's rated, ranked, reviewed, doesn't matter. She's the daughter of Lee Tom Leah Thompson, the mother from Back to the Future. She was in a movie that I loved, Why Him, with the now canceled James Franco, with the star of Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston. Loved it. So Zoe Deutsch stars in a new movie that is fascinating. It's a movie that only can be made in 2022. It's called Not Okay because it deals with social media fraud, not catfishing, not Dear Evan Hansen style fraud, but the type where Zoe Deutsch wants to be popular and she befriends someone in a tragic support group who turns out to be a child star and pretends that she has suffered the same fate as this child star. And it turns out nothing's okay about doing that when it didn't actually happen to you and you're only doing it to increase your social media following. You're doing it to elicit sympathy. It's like when Brian Williams, the NBC newscaster, pretended he was in like a crash during wartime coverage and he wasn't even on the helicopter or he was on the helicopter and it didn't crash. And then all of a sudden he was off the news and then he rehabilitated on MSNBC and then people forgot and then everything was okay because he had the epiphany that, oh, I can be better and then he was better because we love reclamation projects. Well, they made a whole movie about what it means to not be okay. And that is the theme of the movie because that is one of the social media buzzwords, I'm not okay. I like that in this day and age of mental health awareness. I think one of the things that people do, and they do it way too often, how you doing? Fine. What's going on today? Nothing. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Well, you just learned nothing about your friend, about your partner, about your employee, about your employer. That puts the surf in surface. 
I love doing that to people. It's so disarming. Coke and I do this all the time. Hey, how you doing? I don't want Coca to say fine. Hey, you okay? I don't want to say I'm okay. I want him to say I'm not okay. I want to hear from him what's going on. I worry about him and I want to help him. He feels the same about me. He doesn't accept it when he calls me up and we're preparing for a show. Hey, how you doing? I say, whatever, I'm fine. No, no, David, what's going on? And now I think he could be being selfish. Like you got to be in the right headspace to do the show because this is our career. This is our job. This is our money. And I think he generally cares. I'm going to go with that. But when people say, how are you? Sometimes you should actually answer and notice how incredibly uncomfortable it is when you do answer. I love doing this. Hey, how you doing? Well, the following five things are going on right now in my head. I've got a situation at home. My child does this. My spouse does that. My friends do this. My work does that. And I'm really trying to workshop all these different situations. Any suggestions on any of it? And the person looks at you and says, whoa, um, I thought you were just going to say fine. This movie is about the ability to not say fine. What happens when you don't say fine? What happens when you say you're not okay? What happens when you do something that's not okay? Check out the movie. It's okay. Correction, I, I said the word wrong, it's over, okay? I get it. It's cavalry, not Calvary. I said it wrong, okay? Are we good? Can we, can we stop with all the tweets and all the DMs? You tried talking 45 minutes and saying every word wrong or right. Okay, let's talk about Rodolfo Castro. Remember that name? He's that player who was sliding into third base and his cell phone fell out of his pocket. Did I have a wait to see about him getting suspended, Coca? I must have, because I knew it. Check that, would you? Rodolfo Castro yesterday was suspended one game for having his cell phone on the field. Michael Hill is in charge, the man I used to work with for all those decades. He's now in charge of on-field operations. I thought I did have a wait to see, Coca. I think you're wrong. Someone tell me, if you're listening to this show, if you remember a wait to see that this guy's going to get suspended. It had to happen. Now, Coca does keep track of every single day, so I tend to believe him because I don't keep track. And frankly, I can't remember from one show to the next what I say without you telling me what I said. Why would this player get suspended for a game? Do you think this young player was using his cell phone to somehow video signs, catcher signs and relay it to his clubhouse? Do you think he was using the flashlight on his phone? Was he texting anyone? I told you what he was doing. He may have been texting some people in the stands. He was clearly not stealing signs. He forgot his phone in his pocket. But the reason I told you Mike Hill had to suspend him is with all the stuff that went on with electronic device usage, from Apple Watches used by the Yankees and Red Sox to cheat, to garbage cans used by the Astros to cheat, to the nightmare that was the late 2010s. The next person who had any electronic device, even if accidental, was going to be made an example of. It didn't matter. They took the time to interview Castro because that's what they do at Major League Baseball. They interview the player and say, excuse me, what were you doing with your phone? Were you doing anything nefarious with your phone? No, I swear to God. I don't mean nefarious on your personal life. Were you doing anything nefarious as it relates to the game? I'm sorry, nefarious? Nah, not really. I'm mortified. I can't believe it. It's a nightmare. I shouldn't have had it. Wait, is that what I was supposed to say, Derek? Yes, that's what you say. Say you had no idea it was in there. You'd never go on the field with a phone. Yes, Mike, I would never go on the field with a phone. I would never do anything to hurt the integrity of the game. What team does he play for? It's the Pirates, isn't it? What do you think, that we're doing well? You think it's working? You think I'd be that bad at disseminating information? Come on, Mike. Give this guy a break. Mike hears it, goes back to Rob Manford, Dan Helm, and says, hey, he didn't do anything. This was a total accident, but guess what? We have to make an example of him. Just give him one game. He's gonna appeal it, but we cannot change it on appeal. We'll do a wait to see here, Coca, by the way. Uh, his suspension will not be reduced. He is going to serve his one game suspension. It's going to be upheld. And the reason it's going to be upheld is Mike Hill has to make it very clear to the players that we will not have any 
appearance of any electronic devices. I don't care whether it was a mistake. I don't care whether you were doing nothing. We need our fans and our gambling partners to know that everything is on the up and up. So clearly, that is what is going to happen to Rodolfo Castro. Wait to see. He's out one game. Nothing. Personal pick of the day. Blah. I think it's over, Coca. Can you make sure that for the rest of the season, I don't pick the Jays? Like if I ever put the Jays in the rundown, just say you're not allowed to do it. How the Jays lost to the Orioles again is beyond comprehension. Beyond. When are they going to realize the Orioles are going to catch them, be better than them, and the Toronto Blue Jays are now in danger? They could even miss the damn playoffs. And my Verlander over the White Sox pick was a good one, but the bullpen blew it. 0-2 or 85-69. and 69. Still 16 over, but that hurt. I wanted to get to 20 over. That's what I was doing, right? When you're 18 over and you pick two games, you want to get to 20 over and roll from there. Now I'm back to 16 over and I'm only going to do one game. And this game is an interesting one. The Brewers-Dodgers series has been something. The Brewers won the game last night. The Dodgers, best team in baseball, had won 12 in a row, lost to the Royals. They're playing a Brewers team that has not been playing well since the All-Star break. So many teams have not been playing well since the All-Star break. But I'm more focused on this pitching matchup. You've got Tony Gonsolin going for the Dodgers. When Walker Buehler was announced as out for the season, Tony Gonsolin, in his mind, he's been pitching well all season. He's going to regress because he is not a Cy Young type of pitcher. But it's one thing when you think that your star is coming back at some point and you're holding down the fort and you muster up the energy and the talent and the results to hold down the fort while a player's injured. But that mentality changes when you learn that that player is not coming back. You realize there's no lifeline, there's no lifeboat, there's no saving you. You have got to be out there helping to lead this staff on a team that is due to win the World Series. This is the first start of Tony Gonsolin since Bueller was ruled out for the season, and I believe it will impact him, and God knows the Brewers want to win this game, and they've got Lauer going. Take the Brewers over the Dodgers. Regression's a real thing, Tony. All right, let's talk about the Yankees. We try to uh, satisfy all fan bases here. This is not a show where we only have listeners in New York or LA. We started with having most of our listeners in Florida. Now it's a very small percentage of this big show is from Florida. It's many years ago that it was Florida-based. But the Yankees are always a popular topic for me to talk about, not just because I'm in New York, but because they always give us so much to talk about, sort of like the Cowboys and the Commanders. There's just always stuff going on. The Yankees right now have one of the worst records in the league since the All-Star break. Their last 35 or 40 games, they're below 500, and that's not a short sample size anymore. They were on their way to their third straight shutout with an offense that was really hitting the cover off the ball for the first part of the season when they were heading toward a record, trying to become the best team in history, and everyone said it's done. They've run away with the AL East, and they are now going to be the best team in the history of baseball. You have the players saying how important it was to stay focused. We haven't won anything yet. They said all the right things. None of this matters if we don't win the World Series. To win the World Series, we want a home field advantage. To have home field advantage, we've got to have the best record, not just in the American League, but in all of baseball. All of a sudden, they had a group of starting pitchers that were the best in the league. Everyone's saying... They did it. Cashman finally put together the deepest team, the most imposing lineup, the deepest rotation. And we told you that their rotation was made with clay, and then it rained. And now the Yankees are the Yankees, and they're a mediocre team. Stanton's been hurt. LeMahieu's hurt. Clay Holmes is hurt. Severino's hurt. Everyone has injuries. The Yankees have the money to get through the injuries but they just make a bunch of bad decisions. How long is it going to be before you realize that signing Aaron Hicks to a long-term deal was not good? How long is it going to be till you realize that Josh Donaldson is not Josh Donaldson? How long did it take you to was not going to make it in New York? How long until you realize that you brought DJ LeMahieu back at a salary that he no longer was a bargain and now he's not performing the way he did when he was a bargain and helping you win a tremendous number of games? 
How many years are you going to keep Chapman until you realize he can't close anymore? The Yankees have made their bed, and now they're lining it. And the bed is made up of underperformance by so many players in the lineup, a starting rotation that lacks depth, a bullpen that lacks the ability to get you through October, and they have reverted to an ordinary team. Think about that. Every year we do the same thing with fans, and fans, for whatever reason, never learn. April, May, June, don't talk to me until August. Don't tell me how crappy I am, and don't tell me how great I am. It's such a long season. Well, after 20 games, Aaron Judge has 20 homers. He's on pace for 162 homers. It just makes me laugh. Tampa Rays came in and won last night again, three to one, with a payroll that's a fourth the size of the Yankees' payroll, with pitchers who they pitched last night. Raza Rainey, you've heard of, he was in the World Series. He's now in the middle of their lineup, hit a three run homer, and it stuck because the Yankees could not score four runs. They were lucky to score one run. Good on them. People are calling for the end of Brian Cashman. Before the season started, I didn't think Boone or Cashman would be brought back. Then they were brought back. Then they started off the way they were started off, and everyone thought they were going to get extensions. What do you think Cal Steinbrenner is thinking right now? Because as calm as he wants to appear to you, the fan, there are meetings going on in the front office between Hal Steinbrenner and Brian Cashman, between Hal Steinbrenner and Aaron Boone, all three of them together, between Hal Steinbrenner and people not working for the Yankees who he counts on for advice. And he's asking the same question. Is this the Yankee team or was that the Yankee team? When you've had a season that is so not inconsistent because when you have an inconsistent team where you go three and seven one week, seven and three the next week, three and seven the next week, seven and three the next week, it's very hard to know who you are. It's very hard to get down and talk to those players and try to understand the mentality of how they keep going up, down, up, down over a short period of time. But when you've got a team that is up, 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 they're eight and two, seven and three, eight and two, nine and one, eight and two, seven and three, one, six and four, no big deal, back to eight and two. And then all of a sudden they fall off the cliff and they go back to two and eight, three and seven, two and eight, four and six, three and seven, a six and four. When that's the story of your team, you don't know what kind of team you have. During August is the time you are starting to look at next year. You are, of course, thinking about the playoffs if you're a playoff team, but you're starting your meetings in your front office about next season right now. The Yankees are figuring out, and they're doing it in a flow chart scenario. If we get to the World Series and win, okay, then we know that we were the April, May, June team, and we are going to bring it back, and we will overpay for Judge, and we will figure this out. If we get eliminated in the wild card round or the division series, then we are the July, August, September team. And we've got to make significant changes, whether it's releasing players, trading players, not re-signing players. It's obvious that the way we make up our team is not leading to success in October. And the discussions are happening now. And the Yankees are players are not doing themselves any favor. They're making it really easy for the front office to say, "Uh uh-oh, the beginning was the mirage, not now. But there is still time. So for Yankee fans out there, look for a turnaround and always say tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Once it starts, we're going to be back and we're going to roll right into October and through October. If that tomorrow doesn't start in the next two weeks, September is not enough time for that sort of roll to begin. I guess we'll have to wait to see. We didn't get to Simmons again. How does that even happen? Ben Simmons, the 76ers player, two days in a row. He settled with the Sixers. We have to talk about how he settled his grievance. The Sixers are going to pay him an amount of money when he didn't play because of mental health or because he just didn't want to play because his feelings were hurt. But of course, it wasn't going to go to arbitration. They settled. Yeah, we'll get to it. It's just business. This is nothing personal.